Okay, I think we can get started. Um, so thanks everyone for making your way down for today's uh, first session for the semester by our club. Um, it's actually going to be presented by our EXCO members, specifically the Head of Research um, Development and Education. So today we'll be sharing more about layer tools in the future. Um, I understand that the last couple of months or the last year has been kind of rough in terms of the whole blockchain space. So um, we try to get this year started on a clean slate and there's no better time to learn and to build than the present, right? So with that, um, we'll be happy to get started with our webinar on layer tools in the future. So guys, take it away. All right, uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Wing Ki, I'm the head of research. So today we'll be discussing the topic on layer two scaling solutions. So as you all know, uh, scalability of the blockchain network is actually a very crucial factor in the uh, success and adoption. So with the increasing number of transactions and applications built on top of the uh, network and blockchain, uh, we actually need to find ways to handle the increased demand for processing power and storage. So this is where layer two solutions come in. So today we'll be looking into the selection of four layer two uh, scaling solutions. So uh, yeah, Polygon, uh, Arbitrum, Optimism, and Decating. So in this, in this presentation, we will be discussing the technical details of these solutions as well as how it compares to other uh, layer two solutions. Uh, yeah. Okay, so without further ado, let's dive into the world of uh, layer two scaling solutions and learn more about how they help to solve these scalability issues. Okay, so uh, why do we need a layer two? So to look to, to, to understand why we need a layer two, uh, let's first look at uh, layer one. Okay. So layer one of a blockchain refers to the underlying protocol or base layer that facilitates the function, uh, the basic functionalities of, of the blockchain, such as uh, maintaining a decentralized ledger, uh, executing smart contracts. So uh, examples of layer ones are like Ethereum, Binance uh, Smart Chain, Bitcoin. Yeah. So the scalability of these layer ones are limited by several factors. So first is the network uh, throughput. So the network throughput is actually the number of transactions that can be processed by the net network, and it is limited by the capacity of the network, which is determined by the number of nodes that are processing power at the block size. So next uh, is the consensus mechanism. So some consensus mechanisms, uh, they are like proof of work, proof of stake. So for proof of work, they are inherently limited by the number of transactions they can, uh, they can process per second. So next is uh, network latency. So transactions need to be propagated to all nodes in the network. Uh, and this can take time, especially in uh, large networks. So this actually can lead to delays in confirmation times, which will affect the overall scalability of the network. So next is uh, data storage. So uh, storing all the transaction data on the blockchain can consume uh, like a lot of storage space. So this will make it also harder to, to, to scale the network. So lastly is security. So increasing the scalability of the network can make it less secure as it becomes more vulnerable to access from, from uh, bad actors. So due to this limitation, uh, layer one of, of a blockchain is often not considered to be sufficiently scalable to handle the high volumes of uh, transaction volumes, which are required by uh, centralized applications and other blockchain-based projects. So layer two solutions like uh, state channels, plasma, side chains have been developed to help solve these scalability issues. So what are, what are layer twos? So layer twos uh, is a set of off chain or like a separate blockchain that is built on top of the existing layer one. So the purpose of a layer two is to help eliminate uh, bottlenecks through scaling and data. So to, to illustrate the relationship between a layer one and a layer two, uh, so just think of a layer one, a, a layer two as uh, like a meal prep station in the kitchen. Lah. So they actually, they have like a different stations for cutting, cooking and assembly. So this actually helps each task become more efficient. So then when the timing is ideal, the final person can assemble the whole dish and send it to the customer. So simply put, uh, layer two is just an uh, umbrella term uh, that describes the solution uh, that are built uh, on top of the layer one to help make the networks more scalable. So layer two, uh, layer two scaling solution actually helps uh, with increasing the capabilities of layer ones by handling the transactions uh, off chain. So the two main uh, capabilities that can be improved are transaction speed and transaction throughput. So uh, for example, uh, in the old Ethereum, so Ethereum one uh, can actually can process about 15, uh, 15 transactions per second. 
on its base or main chain layer. Uh, whereas Ethereum 2 has actually skipped uh, Ethereum 1 uh, blockchain to some extent, it actually uses proof of uh, stake and sharding that increase the transaction uh, throughput on layer 1. Uh, however, layer 2, uh, layer, 2 solutions, layer 2 scaling solutions can enable Ethereum 2 to handle thousands, hundreds and thousands of transactions per second. Okay, so for the purpose of uh, layer 2 solutions, so layer 2 solutions, uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, they work by offloading some of the computation and storage uh, required uh, for transactions to a separate layer. So layer 2 solutions such as like Polygon Network, they provide several benefits over the traditional layer 1 blockchain network. First and foremost, scalability is uh, greatly improved because of the because processing transactions and smart contracts of the main chain will allow allow for uh, significantly increased transaction throughput and faster computation time. So additionally, users can expect to pay lower uh, lower gas fees as well because layer two solution reduce the congestion on the main chain. So this will uh, significantly reduce the cost of transactions. Uh, security is also actually improved on uh, the layer two solution because they provide an additional layer of security by separating the main chains from the, the child chains or the side chains which actually reduce the risk of uh, a single point of failure. So uh, in a sense, the user experience is also improved because of the faster computation times, uh, lower fees, and as well as, the, as well as the increase in security. So this will actually uh, make the, the apps uh, more easily and more easily usable and uh, the overall experience will be more seamless. Next, uh, interoperability is also another important benefit of uh, layer two solution. They enable different blockchain networks to communicate with each other and allow for like seamless exchange of uh, assets and information. So uh, in general, layer two solutions will also allow for more decentralized and community driven decision. Uh, because it allows, yeah, uh, it allows uh, for token holders to vote and have a stay in the protocol's upgrades and changes. So in conclusion, uh, layer two solutions provide benefits such as scalability, low fee, increased security, improved user experience, better in, in operability, uh, better governance, and, and is more energy efficient. So uh, for, for later solution, uh, it can be considered uh, better than a layer one for a few reasons. So uh, it's better in its scalability, better in uh, its cost efficient, it has increased throughput, a higher flexibility, and better inoperability. Okay, so as mentioned earlier, there, there's uh, four main types of uh, layer two solution. So uh, there are side chains, state channel, plasma, and rollups. So Loom Network is a side chain built on top of the Ethereum blockchain that allows for the creation of DApps with higher scalability and lower transaction costs. Uh, examples of uh, state channels include the Lightning Network for Bitcoin and the Rider Network for Ethereum. So this network actually allows for off-chain transactions where parties can transact without the need for every transaction to be recorded on the blockchain. This can help reduce congestions on the blockchain and allows and, and also increase transaction speed and lower cost. Uh, the Matic network is an example of a layer 2 scaling solution built on top of uh, the Ethereum blockchain that uses Plasma-based architecture to enable faster and cheaper transactions. So uh, however, uh, just to mention, uh, Polygon is actually uh, not just limited to, to the Plasma, uh, the Plasma scaling solution. They actually employ uh, multiple, multiple types of, uh, they employ sidechain as well, they employ rollups and employ state channels as well. But the main, the main architecture is uh, Plasma-based. So uh, lastly is the rollups. Arbitrum and Optimism are examples of rollups that we'll be going through later. Okay. So firstly, uh, let's go through the types of uh, layer two solutions, which are state channels. So state channels deal with uh, deal with the state uh, deal with the state update on the blockchain network. So uh, let's let's understand the state channel through an example. So suppose two players want to play a game of Ecto on the zero blockchain. So for this, uh, first the players have to create a multi signature smart contract on Ethereum that contains the rules of Ecto information and and the uh, players and the price for the Ethereum. So then the players have to enter the state channels and begin playing the game. So each uh, each move of 
of the player creates an off-chain transaction that is stored on the smart contract. So when there's a winner, uh, the players close the channel by signing the final state and submitting it to the multi-signature uh, multi contract. So the final state of the, the, the contract is then stored on Ethereum multi-chain and the price money of the one Ethereum is transferred to the winner. So essentially, it's, uh, it's, it's an off-chain uh, communication channel. Uh, yeah. Okay, so next is the uh, side chains. So side chains are separate blockchains and uh, each of these chains have own set of rules, functionalities, and purposes. So unlike uh unlike other uh, layer two side chains um are responsible for their own security. So another important point about side chains is that uh they need their own nodes to validate uh, transactions and create a block. They also have their own consensus mechanisms uh such as uh, like like block material uh, block parameters. So they are a uh, block validating validating nodes uh, earn the rewards for their work in the sidechain in the same manner that other blockchain work. So the main job of a sidechain is to uh, process and uh, validate data for the main chain or add functionalities such as uh, running smart contracts for blockchains that are unable to do that like, uh, like Bitcoin. So sidechains communicate with uh, sidechains communicate with the main chain via a two-way pack. So these are two WP. So uh, the sidechain is also called a pack uh, sidechain. So a two-way pack is uh, actually acts as an uh, intermediary, intermediary, sorry, uh, to facilitate the transfer of assets and coins from the, the main chain layer one to the side chain layer, which is the layer two, and vice versa. So uh, under all, uh, under the, the the what happens is that uh, the coins are actually not transferred, and instead they are temporarily locked in the main chain by creating a transaction. So a second transaction is generated locked, uh, to, to lock the same amount of uh, equivalent coins in the side chain. Yeah, so the coins on the main chain can be unlocked only when the equivalent amount of coins on the side chains are locked again. Yeah, so this is done to avoid the presence of free coins on both chains and to prevent the double spending uh, problem. Yeah, so the, the, the two way pack system actually enables the interested party to get a transaction on the side chain without revealing information to the entire network. Uh. Okay, so for Plasma, so Plasma is also a, a, another a scaling solution. Uh, but Plasma leverages on smart contracts and local trees to uh, create an unlimited number of child chains, uh, transaction copy of the parent blockchain. So they will actually offload transactions from the from the main chain into the child chains, uh, which allows for faster and cheaper transactions. So like side chains, uh, each child chain is treated as a separate blockchain with its own consensus mechanism node block size and block time. However, like channel, uh, Plasma actually leverages on the security of the main chain. So the main chain and child chain are tied together through smart contracts that actually contain the rules guiding each child chain. Uh, the contract acts as the bridge that lets the participants move digital assets and coins between them within the main and the, the, the child chains. And initially all the and initially all the transactions have to be created on the main chain. So uh, how does the Plasma work? So the child chain operator actually lays uh, lays down the rules. Uh, the child chain operator, which is the, 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 the main chain, will actually lay down the rules in which the child chain operates. And uh, then the process transactions will stay on the, the plasma chains. So however, the blockchain, which contains the merkle roots of each block of the plasma chain, are submitted and recorded in the blocks of the main chain. So this actually reduces the main chain's network congestion and thus uh, allows tens of thousands of transactions to be uh, processed simultaneously in plasma chains. So uh, the data on the child chains is actually validated using prop proofs. So prop proofs are actually a mechan mechanism by which anyone can determine if the data is invalid using the uh, Merkle's proof. So for example, when fraud occurs on a, a plasma chain, uh, whether it's double spending or, or one cash out more than they have in all accounts, uh, anyone can actually provide a proof a prop proof to uh, prove the transaction invalid. So if uh, the transaction is proven fraud, then it will actually be broke back. So benefits of uh, Plasma is that they are more favorable than channels uh, because they can because one can send assets and coins to anyone, whereas for channels, it occurs between, uh, between two parties only. So yeah. Next will be rollups. Okay, so rollups are a type of layer two scaling solutions for uh, blockchain networks, uh, especially and specifically for Ethereum. So 
they are a way of offloading some of the computational load from the main Ethereum network uh, to, the, to the separate off-chain. So rollups actually work by batching multiple transactions together into a single transaction and rolling them up and then uh, rolling them up into a single transaction in the uh, main Ethereum network. So essentially they bundle all the small transactions up into one big one before processing it on the main chain. So this reduces the number of transactions that need to be processed on the main Ethereum network. So this actually increases the overall scalability of the network. The rollup transactions are actually pro are processed by the smart contract in Ethereum main chain. Uh, and this is called the rollup contract. The rollup contract is responsible for validating and executing the rollup transaction. And it also manages the state of the rollup network. So the rollup transactions are validated by a set of validators. Uh, who are responsible for ensuring that the transactions are valid and the state is correct. So these, uh, these validators typically choose the proof of state uh, mechanism. Uh, the roll-up transactions are sent to a witness contract uh, on the Ethereum main chain, which stores a commitment of the roll-up transaction. Yeah, so uh, these commitments serve as the proof that the transactions have been processed and they are valid. So roll-ups offers uh, a way to scale the Ethereum network by reducing the number of transactions that need to be processed on the Ethereum uh, network. So there are actually two, two main types of rollups, uh, optimistic rollups and VK rollups. So both types of rollups offer a way uh, to scale the Ethereum network by reducing the number of transactions. So optimism rollups is a type of rollups that use a technique uh, called optimistic execution that actually that ensures the security of the rollup transaction. In optimistic rollups, uh, the rollups transactions are pro processed off chain and the state of rollup is stored off chain. The rollup contract on the main Ethereum network only serves as a way to verify the rollup transactions, uh, whether they are valid or not. So the rollup contract is actually used to, to, to validate uh, the rollup transaction and it also stores the commitment of the rollup transaction. So this, com uh, this commitment serves as a proof uh, to the, that the rollup transactions have been processed and they are valid, like I explained earlier. So some examples of uh, optimistic rollups are optimism. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the next is zk rollups, which are which are uh, which stands for a uh, zero knowledge rollup. So uh, zk rollups uh, are, is a type of rollup that use zero knowledge proof to ensure the security of the the rollup transaction. In zk rollups, uh, the rollup transactions are process off-chain and the state of, uh, of the rollup is, is stored off-chain, uh, similar to the optimistic rollup. And the contract, uh, the rollup contract is on the main Ethereum network, serves as a way to ver verify that the rollup transactions are valid. Uh, so the rollup contract is used to validate similarly, and this commitment serves as a proof to the rollup transactions have been processed they are valid. So ZK rollups use uh, the zero knowledge proof to prove that the rollup transactions are valid without revealing any information about the transactions themselves. So in ZK rollups, the roll uh, the transactions are also bundled together along with the uh, ZKP, which is the zero knowledge proof that verifies their validity. So these ZKPs are used to ensure it's valid. So another important aspect of ZK rollups is that they use a technique called uh, SNARKS, S-N-A-R-K-S, which are in non-interactive argument, uh, argument of knowledge, uh, which will be explained further by Tim later. Okay, so uh, due to the interest of time, we'll be skipping the video summary and we'll be talking about Polygon now, which uh, uh, which, which uses the plasma type, uh, the, the plasma scaling solution. So what is Polygon? So Polygon, uh, formerly known as Matic, is a layer two scaling solution built on top of the Ethereum blockchain. So it use, uh, uses a Plasma-based architecture to increase the speed scalability of the Ethereum network by allowing for independent processing of transactions and smart contracts on type chain, uh, which is known, known as the uh, Chao chain. So the Polygon network uses a two-way pack mechanism that enables users to move their assets back and forth uh, between, uh, between, the Polygon network, between the Polygon network and the Ethereum main chain. Uh, providing additional flexibility and secure, uh, security. So this is done through the process called proof of safety and proof of custody, which ensures the, the security of assets when they are on the child chain. So Polygon is also, uh, also uses a unique uh, consensus mechanism 
which is called proof of stake, uh, which I guess most, most of you all have, uh, are familiar with. So this actually allows for more energy efficient and secure network. Yeah. So overall, Polygon aims to address the scalability issues faced by Ethereum network, and it provides a faster and cheaper and more secure alternative uh, for building and deploying decentralized applications. So uh, for its token and governance, uh, Polygon's native token is called Matic, and it's, uh, it's used as a governance token to pay, and also to pay for transaction fees on the Polygon network. So the Matic token is actually a ERC Matic token, and can be stored in any Ethereum wallet and traded on various cryptocurrency exchanges. So the Polygon network is governed by a group of validators who are responsible for maintaining the network and ensuring its security. So uh, the val these validators are actually elected uh, by, ho by holders of the Matic token through a process called staking. Yeah. So in summary, uh, the Matic token is the native token of Polygon network and is used for governance and to pay for transaction fees. Okay, so um, Polygon's architecture has uh, six main features. So they, uh, so let me explain this, uh, these key components before uh, explaining how it works. So uh, firstly, the root chain. So the root chain is the main Ethereum blockchain that acts as the backbone of the whole Polygon network. So it's, uh, it's responsible for maintaining the overall security of the system and ensuring the power transactions on the child chain are valid. So next will be the child chain. So child chains are, are side chains. They are connected to the root chain as explained earlier. So next will be the proof of stake validators. Uh, so proof of stake validators are responsible for uh, validating the transactions on the child chain and they are elected by the Matic tokens holders and are incentivized to act honestly by rewarding by being rewarded uh, with the transaction fees. So next is the Matic token. The Matic token, as I explained earlier, is used to pay for transaction fees and also used to elect the proof of stake validators. So uh, fifth is the two-way pack. So the two-way packs allows the user to move their assets back and forth Matic network and Ethereum main chain. So this allows the this allows to use the uh under the benefit of the faster and cheaper transactions on the Polygon network uh while keeping your assets safe on the Ethereum uh main chain. So lastly is the, the Plasma framework. So uh the Polygon network uses its own implementation of the Plasma framework and uh is customized to work with the Ethereum network. So this allows uh, uh allows it to handle higher throughput, faster confirmation, and uh provide security guarantee. Yeah. So uh, all in all, um, the, the Polygon network uh, consists of the main chain, as I explained earlier, the Polygon root chain, and multiple side chains called the child chain. So the root chain is, uh, uh, well, the root chain is responsible for the overall security. The child chain works in compliance with the network's rules. So the child chain is actually connected. Uh, the child chain is connected to the, to the main chain used by a two-way pack, and these mechanisms as mentioned earlier, allows them to move the assets back and forth, uh, back and forth the child chains and the root chains. So by moving their assets, uh, by by moving assets to the child chain, uh, they can actually the child chain use a uh, a proof of stake mechanism, which is more energy efficient and more secure. Uh, yeah. So the child chains, uh, can be used to deploy uh the apps and process transactions, uh, because they are they are they're less congested as well. So, uh, so yeah, so this is how the uh, whole Polygon architecture actually looks like. Uh, yeah, so currently, uh, these are, these are a few of the Polygon projects that are uh, a bit more prominent. So the, one of the, the more prominent game, uh, projects is Avegochi. So, uh, Avegochi is uh, actually a blockchain based game that allows, uh, players to, to raise and, uh, better goals like creatures called Avegochi. Uh, so it's uh, the one on top. So, uh, so players can actually acquire these Avigochi through the, the through RV. Yeah. So next is QuickSwap. So QuickSwap is a DEX, uh, decentralized exchange built on the Polygon network. Right? So uh, it's it's a it's like a it's a fork of the popular Uniswap exchange. Right? Yeah. So decentralized game next decentralized games is a blockchain based gaming platform that allows uh users to play and and wager on a variety of games using cryptocurrencies. Right? So they have like blackjack, uh, poker, and and stuff like that. So, uh, decentralized, uh, decentralized, uh, has a partnership with uh Polygon, uh, so they actually provide their own side chain on Ethereum. So Polygon provides the side chain, uh, for decentral games uh, on Ethereum. So these side chains can be used, uh, used by them to to provide fast and very cheap transactions. 
So next is IDEX. IDEX is another DEX built on the uh, Polygon network. Uh, Agur is actually a decentralized uh, prediction market platform. So it allows uh, users to create and participate in the market uh, by predicting the outcome of events, such as uh, sport games and political elections. Uh. Yeah, and lastly is uh, Opacity. So Opacity is uh, a decentralized crowd storage platform. So it allows uh, users to secure, securely store and share their files and, and uh, data in a decentralized manner. So yeah. All right, so for the intro time, we'll skip this video as well. And I'll pass the time on to Bill to talk more about the DK rollups. Okay. Uh... Thanks, Wiki, for the uh, for the introductions to Polygon. Uh, now I will be talking about the zero knowledge show us. So firstly, uh, we will move on to talk about what is a zero knowledge proof first. So next this. Okay. So zero knowledge proof first appear in uh, 1985 papers by uh, uh, God Wassers and is described a system of interactive DK proof. Uh, so from now on, I will, uh, uh, the, I will refer ZK as a ZK zero knowledge for short. So in this paper, is the scheme enable everyone to verify sensitive information without revealing it detail to the third parties? Next, please. So. Uh, in a zero knowledge proof or a ZKP, there is three components. First is the witness. It's the sensitive information that uh, a ZK proof need to guard. Uh, second one is the proofers. It's a party who holds a witness or the party who wish to keep their secret information. And finally, is the verifiers. It's uh, another parties who want to verify if the proofer actually does process the information. So moving on, uh, to make a ZKB, we need three criteria. It is completeness, soundness, and uh, zero knowledge. So completeness meaning if the input is valid, the ZK protocols always return choose. The soundness is that uh, in case someone cheat someone found a way to cheat the ZKP protocols, the uh, probability of success is marginally small. And finally, the zero knowledge property means the protocol leaked no information to the third parties. So next, please. So uh, this uh, picture describes uh, the criteria uh, in a mathematical formulas and more succinctly. So firstly, we can see there's a proof on the left. She uh, holds some secret information that would be, and for the proof to be complete, if the verifier and the proofer is honest, the verification must be choose all the times. So next is the summit. If there's a, so zero knowledge meaning uh, you compute functions by, equal to the functions of the information. So if the y's differ from FWB, we think that uh, uh, the proofers or the verifier attempt to cheat the systems and the verification is successful. So the probability of success is smaller than two to the power of minus 100. And this can be any smaller numbers. And finally, is the proof zero knowledge meaning the proof leak no information about the double V's. So essentially zero knowledge proof mean trusted computation. So it's it's not actually uh, related to privacy. It's uh it's mean that you can trust other party actually do the work and compute the F double V honestly. So next please. So they there's two scheme to uh, work out a uh, zero knowledge proof. First is interactively. So uh, interactive DK proof meaning we must have the proofer and the verifier online at the same time and they can be back and forth. So the exchange uh, information and then the proof can be formed when the 
probability of cheating reach a certain small numbers. But this is not ideal for blockchain use case. Things are uh, not all the nodes can be available all the times, especially in the case where uh, you have some verifier who can go offline. So that is uh, why we created a second one, a non-interactive NK proof. And this only requires one round of setup and uh, neither party need to be online. And a very important part is that the ZK proof can be reused for future verifications. So this allows for automations and uh, is very suitable for blockchain and distributed systems in case uh, moving on this. So uh, all the definition above is quite abstract. And uh, let's move on to about an examples of an interactive ZKP schemes. So uh, let's say we have four other schemes as well. First, we have Alex and Bob. Alice is the uh, uh, verifiers who Alice is the uh, proofers who enter village of colorblind peoples, and they don't believe that color exists. So, in the village, we have Bob, uh, who wish to who wish to verify that Alice actually knows about colors. So Bob want to verify that there's information about colors. So if Bob wish to do this, uh, Alice will then uh, give Bob a set of balls, let's say five balls, and amongst the five balls, four of them are blues and one of them is red. So since Bob is colorblind, Bob cannot know uh, if the red ball is different from the blue balls. Then uh, Bob will prove to Alice, uh, uh, then Alice will prove to Bob that uh, they actually color by uh, consistently picking out the correct red balls. So uh, next this. So the scheme go as it goes. Alice say that I know the solutions. And then Bob hold the five ball, which is four blue and one red. And then uh, Alice pick the ball correctly. So only Bob know about the uh, the order permutations. And then uh, that is the proof is and the challenge part. And then if Alice pick the correct ball, then uh, Bob can be sure that Alice actually knows some information about the ball, which is not available to him seeing he's colorblind. So if they go on and on to uh, testing the Alice knowledge about color, then the probability of fake knowledge will be 0.2 times the time of challenge. And uh, let's say after 50 or 100 times, Bob can actually verify that Alice knows something about colors, but Bob has no idea about the colors. Then he's born colorblind all the time. So that is an interactive ZK knowledge proof. So moving on, next please. We have non-interactive the zero knowledge proof. And it's go as follow. We have so this a very high overview of how the scheme works. We have a function called backup proof. And uh, this function will normally be a trusted party who compute all the public variables to the network. And then this send confidential info for the proofers. And then uh, move on to the second step that he or she will get the proof. And then once the verifier need to verify the proof, he will she he or she will receive the proof along with the public parameter from the trusted setup. And then uh, he or she will call the check approve functions and get the result. So the result of the this function will correctly. Uh, indicated whether the proofer actually hold the confidential information or not. Uh, next please. So this is a, a more technical description of how the scheme work. So let's say we have a, a blockchain with a 
trusted node. So this can be minor or um, verifier of the ZK uh, of the blockchains. So they will provide the network with the R, this is uh, public parameters, and then uh, they will send the uh, public key and the other put, they will send uh, uh, the public parameters along with the prover key and the verifier key to the prover and the verifiers. Then uh, in the lower left uh, red cycles in the picture, you can see the proofers now receive the R and PK. He or she will then use the U and the witness, which is the double V, to compute the proof and the proof will call P. So that is step three. Then in step four, he or she, he or she can send the, to the verifiers that he or she has uh, public parameters only known to him, which is U, and the proof compute by the parameters, which is P. And then afterward, the verifier can verify using all the information available in the networks. So the verifier can actually be anyone who has access to the uh, setups. So uh, next piece. So since we have a non-interactive VK proof, now we can have uh, decentralized systems uh, work as a prover and verifiers. That's uh, give one to two type of ZK proof, which is ZK snack and ZK stats. So snack, which previously uh, uh, described by Winkies, is quite a popular solution on Ethereum scaling right now. So it's still a trusted setup, which we described in the picture in the previous slide. And this will generate public parameters. And then the mm, proof size for it is normally very small, but it's increased linearly with, with this size. Then uh, due to some limitation of ZK snap, there is ZK stacks, which stand for ZK scalable transparent argument of knowledge. They serve similar purpose as the case not, except that they derive a protocol that doesn't require on a, a trusted setup anymore. So this will be more transparent. So you guys can read the paper in the research later to understand more the detail. So essentially they are using a probabilistic uh, uh, random generation to uh, get all the public parameters available to the network. So uh, the prover and the verification times uh, in these protocols only slightly increase at the witness growth. So it's more scalable, but the proof size is normally very large on small input. Uh, next please. So that's why both of the system is still utilizing ZK snack right now. So this, uh, a uh, picture comparing different kind of non-interactive ZK proof. And we have a scheme called Hulet proof on the right, which is not very, very common. So I haven't talked about it. So here I can see that ZK stack doesn't need a shorter setup. It is shorter inside, but uh, it is longer inside than all the other proof, but it's more scalable. Uh, moving on, please. So we uh, do know that zero knowledge proof enable us to do computations, and uh, the other party can verify the result without accessing to the other transaction data. So this gives rise to many use cases for the blockchains and many other systems also. So. Firstly, we can do identity protection and run it branch. So previously in Web2, we need a trusted party, let's say Google or uh, Facebook to manage your identities. And uh, every time you want to log in into the system, you will compute, let's say, a hash of the password, and then the system will verify it with use. 
So there's a lot of verification protocols in Web2 space, but uh, they somehow still leak some kind of information and uh, there has been a very, uh, so there's been very controversial data breach known to the public. And uh, most infamously is by Facebook, right? So now we have DK proof. We can uh, verify and grant control and access to, uh, to personal identifiers using all decentralized entities, let's say a smart contract on the blockchain. So this enable uh, decentralized entities as an uh, identity management systems. And uh, for because thanks to ZK proof, the authentication process is also simplified. Uh, another use case is anonymous payment. So traditional payment expo information. And uh, now today, most crypto blockchain public or transaction data. So ZPay technologies enable us to uh, privatize those transactions. And uh, some of the examples is the cash or Moneros, which is uh, uh, blockchains have private uh, transactions, or we can uh, privatize public transactions on public blockchains. And uh, one infamous uh, example is Tornado Cash, with high order transaction details. I believe Toledo Cash has been banned also. So uh, moving up is uh, next piece. Okay, so thanks to zero knowledge proof, we have a thing called verifiable computations. As I have discussed before, uh, the zero knowledge proof essentially mean trusted computations. So now we can. Uh, our search computational power from blockchain entities. And then we submit all the transaction result on the blockchains. So this is called ROAS in some sense, as Winky has described in the first part. So the scheme go as follow. The base blockchain or layer one of load transactions to a separate chain. This is our ZK ROAS play to chains and uh, the uh, layer two will then compute all the results with the uh, data and uh, parameters given from layer one and then submit the proof of the computations to smart contracts on layer one and then all this computational result will be used to update the blockchains. So this will be different from the optimistic grow up, we could later be described that uh, our ZK uh, grow up uh, securities rely on cryptographic securities rather than game theory securities. So uh, this mathematically proven rather than economically uh, incentivized proven. So I will give an example of a uh, layer two solution for this quite popular right now, who is implementing the zero knowledge proof on this piece. So we have ZK Sings. Uh, so ZK Sing is a ZK row up solutions on Ethereum power by Matlabs. And if introduce some important concepts, such as account abstractions and ZK models, which is uh, just been available seeing uh, ZK Sing 2.0. And this is being backed by a large group of capitals from uh, reputable uh, VCs and uh, the Ethereum Foundation as well. Uh, next please. So firstly is account abstractions. So account abstractions meaning allow user account to have arbitrary logic in demand. And this is specified by Vitalik and his core developer team in EIP 4337. So to give a bit of background on Ethereum, we have two kinds of account. First is externally owned account, and this account can initiate transactions. So normally you can find these accounts. Uh, an example of this account is like your personal wallet or some multi-sig uh, wallet. And second is the contract account, which essentially comprising of all the smart contracts out there. So uh, 
this has some limitations such that uh, sometimes we need to um, use smart contracts on uh, uh, on user account to uh, implement more complex uh, use cases, or we can uh, have a privacy protocols that somehow need to realize on functionalities of uh, externally owned account. So account abstractions needing, we can uh, still initiate transaction with our account so we can sign and approve transactions, but also implement uh, some logic on top of our accounts. So the design models of this uh, can be uh, found in the links I put at the last line. Uh, moving on, please. And they also introduced a thing called ZK portals. So previously, we only talked about ZK ROPs, which scale up the blockchains. But then uh, there's a problem where um, uh, our computation of things do have to access to on chain data. So ZK portal actually replaces all the uh, on-chain data availability with off-chain node. So they will have trusted node that can accept all the data on the blockchains. And uh, this uh, scale up the blockchain uh, 10x. But uh, uh, with uh, some compromising of securities, but uh, anytime user can opt into either ZK portals or ZK ROP solutions, but one uh, 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 essential difference between uh, ZK portals and optimistic graph is that in uh, ZK portals, there's little, little economic incentive for attackers to uh, sabotage the blockchain than in optimistic graph, which you guys will have more detail later after a few long presentations. So, uh, I space. I believe that is my wrap up about DK and uh, proof for now. And uh, this some uh, information you guys can have to know more about uh, zero knowledge proof and zero knowledge graph. Okay, thank you. All right, hi guys. So it's kind of um, like my turn to kind of give a speech on, on some layer two solutions. So um, after like some great introduction by Winky and Phil, so now that you guys are able to appreciate the inner workings of um, layer two solutions, right? Let me just um, give you like a brief um, high level overview to two other solutions. Um, first uh, of them would be Arbitrum. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah. So Arbitrum is something, um, it's like another layer two solution where there's no necessity for all transactions to be recorded. So like what Phil and Wenke has mentioned, the technique is still called a roll up where transactions are innocent until proven guilty. So what happens when the violation occurs, right, is that fraud will be proven and then the invalid claim is reversed. So if you are the malicious party, of course, you'll be financially uh, penalized as a result of um, committing um, fraudulent transactions to the chain. So let's talk about, um, so, sorry, next slide. So let's talk about Arbitrum's um, governance, right? Oh, sorry, uh, I think one slide back, sorry. Yep, Arbitrum's governance. So um, unlike most other um, chains out there, Arbitrum does not have its own native governance tokens. Um, this is because the company behind Arbitrum, which is called Offchain Labs, simply didn't want to develop another token and allow the use of any Ethereum-based cryptocurrency. So um, next slide, please. So let's look at like the life cycle of Arbitrum's transaction, right? So um, I try to keep this part um, slightly less technical for those that have like a very high barrier of entry to um, the whole blockchain ecosystem. So it's basically split within three phases. The first phase um, basically involves uh, what they call a sequencer, right? Which is basically just an entity designed to kind of designate the transaction ordering. It's basically like the person in charge of telling um, what comes first and then ordering, receiving the transactions from the clients, which is basically just end users like you and I, right? Then after that, it goes on to directly uh, off-chain. So it connects to a L2 node and delivers the signed transactions. Then from the L1 layer, it publishes the transaction in Arbitrum's delayed inbox. Yep. Then we now move on to phase two, which is a soft confirmation layer. 
So the sequence of order transaction is in the off-chain inbox. And then, and then following this, it executes Arbitrum Nitro VM. Um, this is where it incurs L1 and L2 fees. And then um, next, gives transactions um, to receive the clients to receive, right? Without requiring any additional on-chain confirmations. So next, we move on to the next phase, which is phase three. So this is before posting to the Ethereum um, chain, right? So the sequencer, sequencer posts a batch of L2 transactions. So this um, process normally takes a few minutes. So yeah, in case some operators ignore the transactions, the sequencer itself is forced to include it from the delivery box after um, typically around any POC of 24 hours. Yep, so this is just like um, pictorial, the next slide, sorry. Uh, yeah, the next slide is just a pictorial representation of um, what I've gone through. So um, in your free time, once we disseminate this slide, you can kind of look through it to kind of like give you a visual representation of, um, the, of the three kind of um, different phases. Yep. So um, next slide, we'll be moving on to the other um, solution, layer two solution called Optimism. So Optimism, sorry, next slide. Yeah, it's very similar to Arbitrum actually. Um, so they are both layer two solution where there's no necessity for all transactions to be recorded. So next slide. So um, one difference between optimism and arbitrum is that is in the fact that op optimism itself has its own um, native governance tokens. So this allows users like you and I to participate in um, optimism's collective. So it's basically a way for the users to kind of like interact with the chain on a longer and shorter term scale. So they can kind of decide on um, how the project is going to be like and what are the incentives for being within this project itself. Yep. Um, yeah, so let's just talk about um, the brief differences between Optimism and Arbitrum. So in the next slide, I've actually prepared like a very um, condensed um, screenshot of, of all the like main differences that you can kind of take a look at. So I'd like to draw your focus on um, the fraud proofing mechanism between Arbitrum and Optimism, right? As you can see, Arbitrum here uses a multi-round fraud proofing system, whereas Optimism only uses a single round fraud proof. Yes, then um, I'll be talking more on the other slide, but for now, let's look at the other differences. So network performance uh, for Arbitrum is high because it's a focused on a single point of transaction disagreement. And for Optimism, it's actually contrasting because of the lack of, sorry, because of the reliance on L1 to execute the L2 transactions. With regards to virtual machines, Arbitrum uses AVMs, while Optimism uses the more openly available Ethereum virtual machines. So as we, uh, for developers out there looking to enter the Arbitrum or Optimism um, space, Arbitrum supports all EVM uh, languages uh, with more popularity with surrounding Solidity, Flint, and Viper. And Optimism is limited to only Solidity. So if you want to play safe, you could just um, learn Solidity language. Yep. And the token usage, uh, as mentioned before, Arbitrum uses native Ethereum support and Optimism uses uh, wrapped Ethereum. So next slide. So yeah, um, this is um, the main difference or the main interesting difference between Optimism and, and Arbitrum. So optimism single round proof, um, single round fraud proof, sorry, relies on layer one systems to execute the entire layer two transactions. This way the fraud proofing verification is instant. However, this exerts greater gas fees uh, because all the transactions uh, will happen on L1 and L2 itself, layer two, it, layer two fees itself is limited by the layer one um, gas block. Meanwhile, in contrast for Arbitrum, they use a fine combing approach to fraud proofing verification. So by using um, this verification instead, Arbitrum's gas fees are lower. And Arbitrum, as mentioned previously, focuses on transaction. Thank you. So this is basically a summary of the three chains that we've went through before. Uh, feel free to kind of take a screenshot or when, whenever you are ready, just like um, take a picture of this and then you can kind of read it to better understand um, the dif differences between the solutions that we've discussed in today's session. And yeah, um, without further ado, um, thank you for your time and attention. We kind of come to the end of um, today's workshop and I'd like to pass the time back on to Somesh to give his closing remarks. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it was a great presentation put by our EXCO team. So thank you everyone for putting the time to create that presentation. Um, for those of you who just heard about layer 2 for the first time, um, the space is actually very fast when it comes to layer 2. So um, there's actually a lot of, um, research going on in the space as well because there's always the issue of Ethereum scaling and scalability as well as cost, right? And right now, especially um, in what you could call the bear, you can see actually a lot of projects that are currently building these layer two solutions. 
and are actually trying to explore. Um, so I'm not sure if you heard of other protocols such as Scroll or Polygon Hermes. So these are just some of um, the other protocols in the space which are actually exploring the layer two scene, especially the zero knowledge uh, aspect of it, which is something that is really interesting. And if you're interested in privacy related layer twos, you can look at Aztec Network. Um, and there are multiple Twitter threads that you can find actually, where uh, you can figure out more about layer twos and whatnot. So without further ado, I think, um, thank you for everyone uh, for coming for this presentation. We just take a quick picture. So can I request everyone please turn on your camera? Yeah, and whenever you're ready. I'm just in this thing, quick, yeah. quick. Okay, everyone just look into your camera real quick. I'll give you guys maybe a few more seconds just to turn on. All right, here we go, smile. All right, perfect. Thanks, guys. All right, great. thank you, everyone, for coming to our first session. There'll be uh, many more exciting sessions coming throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, but without further ado, thank you, everyone, and have a great night.